Welcome. Thanks for joining Hacking HR's online conference, Leading HR in the New World of Work. I hope you've been able to attend at least one of today's seven earlier sessions, which included thought leaders like Dave Ulrich and John Boudreaux. If you haven't, you haven't completely missed out because we'll be making all of these available soon on demand. I'm Heidi Glickman and I have the distinct pleasure of moderating our eighth panel today. The focus of the eighth panel is leading HR in a chaotic, volatile, tech-driven world of work. So for over 30 years, we've been discussing this concept of operating in a VUCA environment. Um, and during that time, it feels like the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, and ambiguity intensify more and more every year. And during that same time, um, technology continued to advance rapidly and continues to advance even more rapidly as we go forward. So it's a complete game changer when it comes to doing just about everything. So when we think with the end in mind about the outcomes that our organizations are seeking to accomplish, we now have a wide variety of resources that are available to us and can help us as leaders with HR expertise bring our organization's visions and missions to life much more effectively and efficiently. So what I'd like to accomplish in our time together today is threefold. Uh, first, I'd like to broaden our awareness of the options that we as HR practitioners have to help our organization successfully navigate all of this chaos, volatility, and complexity and technological change. Second, I'd like to provide the opportunity for you all to get to interact with a group of really stellar panelists who are practitioners in this space and to learn from those experiences. So what I'd like to encourage you all to um, be sure to write in your questions um, during the session today, and I'll be sure to um, grab a few of those and integrate those into our conversation. Lastly, I want you to leave today's session inspired. So through all of this conversation, make sure you capture at least one nugget, something that you can reflect on and consider going back and doing differently in your own organization um, to help your organizations positively um, navigate all of this change. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we have incredible panelists with us today, and I'll start first by um, introducing Steve Schloss. Steve is currently the Chief People Officer of the USGA. Um, the USGA's mission is to celebrate, serve, and advance the game of golf worldwide. Steve is a progressive and accomplished executive leader, board member, and advisor who has built, scaled, and transformed a diverse range of global organizations and cultures. Steve brings a diverse blend of knowledge, insights, and skills from senior leadership experiences in sports, nonprofit, high growth technology, media, and financial services. Michelle Nunez is the Managing Director of Human Resources at Prairie Capital. Prairie Capital, Capital is a private equity firm focused on growth-oriented mid-market companies. In this capacity, Michelle works with all of Prairie's portfolio companies, as well as the firm's partners on due diligence. Prior to joining Prairie, Michelle's extensive career includes HR leadership roles in large insurance companies and consulting organizations. Next, I'd like to introduce Lucia Guillory. Lucia is the Vice President of People and Places for Verta Health. Verta, you may not have heard of, they were founded just five years ago with the goal of reversing type 2 diabetes in over 100 million people by the year 2025. So getting close to halfway to that, to that objective, um, Lucia really draws on her doctorate in organizational behavior and HR leadership experiences at other Bay Area tech companies to help Verta achieve its mission. Lastly, I'd like to welcome John Sigmund. John is an executive coach, speaker, author, and leadership developer with a diverse range of expertise spanning every sector of the economy. John draws from his extraordinary career as a people leader and C-suite executive um, in all of the coaching that he does today. John helps his clients reach their desired goals through a process of inquiry, awareness, and reflection, and encourages them to turn that all into action. So thank you, Steve, Michelle, Lucia, and John for making time to share your insights and observations with us today. Uh, what I'd like to do is get us started by focusing on some of the general trends you're all seeing play out in your respective organizations. Um, and have you talk a little bit about how you're seeing HR leverage technology and leadership um, to navigate all of this change. So Steve, let's begin with you. Give us sure. a example on USGA and the role you're playing to help your organization transform. 
Uh, sure. Thank you. And hello, everybody out there. So, you know, I, I've had the benefit of doing HR leadership work for about 35 years. And as Heidi mentioned, it's been in a variety of industries and cultures, both here and abroad. And there, there are some common themes here, but the one that comes to mind the most, and I think very much translates to where we are today. And just to give you some context, here I am leading HR in an organization supporting a 600-year-old game, and we're a 125-year-old organization operating in the 21st century. And I'm the first chief people officer the organization has ever had since I joined six years ago. And, and fundamentally, uh, the role that I see looking into the future as you consider the redefinition of work and organization, and in many ways community, is how do organizations bring themselves forward differently into the future? And for us, uh, the intersection of technology is an interesting one because no one would typically expect us to be a technology leader in what it is that we do. And how do we reshape that thinking? So at minimum, what we try to do is look at the world through the lens of what we call passion and capability. How do we achieve passion in the culture while also raising the capability of those inside the organization and achieve a balance between the two? And how do we help transform the organization through that lens? Then you interject and bring in new thinking and technology where it can be leveraged to help people to both be agile and resilient in the way that we serve our community of 24 million golfers, as an example, brings uh, a new way of redefining who we are. And, and I think for HR today and into the future, we suddenly need to play as much as a facilitator of new thinking. And the drive towards innovate as an organization is something that, while it's not a new concept, probably the bar has been raised for HR to step into that void. And whether it's the need to be intellectually curious, to be more contextual, to be more globally aware, to be more inspiring and yet opportunistic, to be an experimenter where maybe we weren't before, all represent a new normal for us. And that's in addition to the future of uh, people analytics and all the things related to data and insight, which I, is burgeoning, the reality is as a facilitator and as a questioner of the future, that alone generates great results, makes a real impact, and also raises the bar of who we are and what we do. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. I love the concept of facilitator, being a facilitator of new thinking um, and really thinking about, you know, any organization that we're in as, as really being able to operate technology and, and see itself as a, a provider of greater experiences based on having that technology available. So, so let's transition to Michelle. Michelle, um, tell us about your experiences working with your portfolio companies. I know they're all navigating pretty significant changes. So we'd love to hear a little bit about it. Great, thanks Heidi. Hi, everyone out there. Um, I think the interesting thing that we face here with our portfolio companies and, and kind of taking a look at what they do and how they, how they work is the fact that they're small to mid-sized companies. So where a larger company will have access to, you know, a variety of tools or have an understanding of kind of their strategy, um, their technology enablements. We're dealing with folks and companies who may, you know, they're, they're in various degrees of life cycle, if you will. So some have, uh, you know, very solid payroll managers who now have to transition to be the head of HR, right? And that's a tough transition to make to someone who has a, you know, a more of an HR generalist type background, but is now going to be the strategist for this organization going forward. So um, trying to enable the, them from a technology platform, which is where I do believe you get the biggest and best opportunity for your organization, which is, you know, where do you get efficiency? How do you gain effectiveness? You know, what what is the norm in a lot of these organizations is, well, we need more headcount. We need more people. In reality, maybe you do, but I think, you know, the ability to look into the organization from a technology platform solution or look at a way to gain efficiency or effectiveness is a real change in the organization. But the critical thing I think with these portfolio companies is there's not a clear understanding of where you're going. And so, you know, you can say, I need more people. I need more technology. I can tell you, you know, you need these, you know, learning and development strategy. 
except if you don't have a plan on where you want to be with your people, if you don't know what your culture should look like, if you don't have an understanding of what your leadership stands for, if you don't, if your leadership's not with you in building a people strategy, you have to help bring them along. So I think what, what we're seeing, Heidi, in there is, you know, technology is going to play a big piece of it, but I think people have to be much more effective in, in enabling their leadership to understand what good human capital management looks like and how they can add value to the organization. So understanding kind of where you're headed and your roadmap is a critical piece to these organizations moving forward. It's a fantastic point. Such major transformation underway and technology can be an enabler of it, but um, you can't rest on your laurels with new technology. You've got to step up as a leader exactly. um, and behave differently to really capitalize on it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucia, so you're leading HR for a startup. Um, you know, I know that entails working with a ton of speed and agility. We'd love to hear about some of the ways you're helping your organization navigate and deliver on your mission. Yeah, so I've been in the startup space for a good bit now, and I actually have also worked in a really large organization. And one thing that I'll say about the distinction between a startup and a very large organization is uh, that need to develop all these foundational things that just have never been there before, um, as was just mentioned. And so right now we're working on all sorts of foundational workflows, which have to do with things like data management, like what role are you in and how can we see in our HRIS that you're in that role and that you're gonna be progressing towards X or Y or Z next? How are we doing compensation? How are we doing equity? How are we doing performance management? All of those things are voids that are seeking an answer, seeking some sort of solution. And so we are in a phase where we are evaluating all sorts of technology on a generally continual basis because there is a new thing that we need to roll out to the business every couple of months. Um, and so that's been really exciting. And the way that I think about the progression in my role or in my space is first it's foundations, then it's efficiency. So how do we work efficiently? Then it's specialization. How do we produce those really specialized career trajectories for people? How do we produce resources for individual departments as opposed to resources for the entire company? And then after that, it's just straight innovation, creativity type of work. Um, and so we're between foundation and efficiency right now. And we're constantly thinking about communication because we are growing so rapidly. So thinking through how do we act as a resource for both our employee base and for the broader organization in facilitating communication between these parties. And so we think a lot about Slack. We think about a lot about how we can make our HRIS more interactive. We think a lot about um, survey systems like Culture Amp and how we can weave all of those things together to deeply understand what our team is going through and how to weave those learnings into the systems that we're building. Fantastic. Great examples. And I love the application of um, Slack, which I you know, hear and have experienced personally um, using, which, which helps increase the speed of conversation and problem solving. Um, you can really make a big, big difference. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But John, you work with an, an array of organizations today. I would love to hear what you're seeing as the opportunities for HR to better leverage all of this data and technology that's available to us to help us yeah. make better decisions and, and have impact. Yeah, terrific. So thank you, Heidi. And the, the beautiful thing about going last sort of in a panel discussion is I get the great opportunity of building off what everyone else has said. So uh, thank you all for giving me, uh, giving me that opportunity. So I really appreciate that. So a couple of things. Uh, that I'm seeing uh, that uh, kind of dovetail into what we've been talking about so far. One of those is making sure that, that, that our organizations have the right level of preparation. So where I come from in North Carolina, we have uh, a saying, we call it, you can't pave over a cow path. And so what that means is, you know, if you don't have your processes ironed out, you don't have things sort of operating smoothly, you're gonna overlay technology on that and you're gonna end up with a mess, right? And one of the pain points uh, that I've noticed with a lot of employees, speaking of the employee experience and all of that, is sort of this these minor little annoyances that employees feel when they come in through the doors of our workplace. So for example, uh, I could go online after this uh, conversation and I could probably order a Xerox printer and have it delivered to my house by the end of the week, right? When I walk through the door of ABC Company, 
right? And I want to order a ream of paper. You know, there's all sorts of emails and forms and policies and procedures, and it might take me a week if I get the right thing I'm looking for. So that creates a disconnect. And the, and the promise really of the technology is to smooth over those disconnects and sort of help bring the outside experience that people have into our organization. So that's sort of promise one from my perspective. So from the sort of rising up from that just a little bit, one of the things that Steve and others sort of talked about really was uh, this idea of sense making. You know, so as HR professionals, part of our role is to help make sense of all of this for employees. You know, and I think back about a book that was written by uh, Thomas Friedman, I believe, I think it's called Thank You for Being Late. And it spoke of all of the acceleration, you know, of technology and how people are sort of left behind that curve, always trying to catch up. And part of part of our role really is to help people make sense out of all of that. And then thirdly, uh, sort of the promise of limiting subjectivity and bias, I see as a big promise really of technology. So we've uh, often complained, rightfully so, uh, that the hiring process is too subjective. And so we try to overlay, you know, uh, competency-based structured interviews on top of that, uh, other kinds of techniques to, to squeeze out that subjectivity, make it more objective. And we've done the same thing with performance management, right? Performance management is inherently subjective to some extent. And so we create these mechanisms like calibration and other sorts of things to squeeze out that subjectivity. So the promise of the technology is, further helping us squeeze out that subjectivity. And at the same time, we just need to be cautious about the human element of it because my experience has been that organizations can often and individuals can often go too far in relying on that, creating a whole other set of unintended consequences and perhaps unintended biases into the process. So lots of promise, all right, with all the technology lots of sort of uh, potholes in the road, right? That we probably need to pave over a little bit before we can uh, achieve that full promise that we have from AI and the, the human machine collaboration, I think is what we're trying to get to. That's a great point. Thank you. So um, let's, let's kind of drill down on a piece of that and come back to um, one of Lucia's examples. So Lucia, as you, um, you know, and there was a question that also came up in the feed as well. Um, that tied back to using, you know, tools like Yammer and other ways to um, create a space for employees to have voice and to communicate more effectively. Now, as you went ahead and um, rolled out um, Slack in your organization, um, were there things that you did to really pave the way so that you weren't paving over a cow path? <laughs> <laughs> Well, luckily for me, Slack was already a part of the organization when I joined. One thing that I have been focusing on since I've been here over the past seven months is optimizing Slack to build relationships. So for instance, we didn't have a manager Slack channel when I joined and through leveraging this manager Slack channel, we've gained so much. We're able to more quickly communicate with managers about changes that are rolling out. We're also able to partner managers, managers together to solve problems that they have. Um, and we're able to leverage managers as their own leaders. Um, so oftentimes managers can share resources that they've used themselves in this channel and converse about problems that they're facing. And so it really produces a sense of community that wasn't there for managers prior in that while we knew who, who our managers were, we never had them in the same place at the same time. And we found that through making that change, there's just so much more energy and so much more connection amongst our leaders. I hear it, Verda. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I would add to that, um, you know, th there's a saying that organizations are by definition nothing more than a connection of conversations and decisions, mm -hmm. and how that ultimately plays itself out, uh, a platform like a Slack or whatever tool that is used in a company to create collaboration is something that is more than likely underutilized or misutilized versus, um, leverage to the degree by which it was originally created for. And I think one of the great challenges that all of us probably will face over time is how do you marry the need to create connection in the organization using technology uh, aligned with the speed of decision making and the ability to engage the right people to get to the outcome you're looking for. So I think right now as the as organization self gets redefined, uh, the communication infrastructure will probably be one of the central roles to ensure success. Mm -hmm. 
for, for me, when I think about the technology that we leverage, I think about producing a sense of identity because I feel like being able to identify with the organization and being able to identify with one another is really critical to enjoying what you do. You know, you want to be part of a team, you want to be part of something. And so when we do rollouts, when we do additions, we try and produce that sense of identity. And with the manager channel and the SMT channel, we described, hey, this is what it is. This is what we want this to be for you. And then we also look for advocates who are going to use the channel at the beginning and show its value. You know, I think having an HR person go in and be like, look at all these HR articles and how they're great for you to learn about management. I've never seen that work. But if you can find a couple of leaders who are passionate and who, who are saying, hey, I want to share with you what I've learned. I want to share with you what I've experienced. And I want to have a discussion with you about it here. That really gets things going. That's a great example, Lucia. I've seen, um, had similar experiences where people just love learning from their peers. And once you create that platform or space to enable that conversation um, and start feeding that a little bit on the front end to encourage usage, um, it takes off like gangbusters. So mm -hmm. way to go. Um, there was a question that came in in the feed that tied back to um, uh, something, Michelle, that you brought up earlier about um, things like, um, you know, or I think John, you might've mentioned it too about behavioral interviewing and competencies and um, how do you, um, what skills and levels do you need to, to help people get clear on what success looks like? So are there things that you're doing, um, Michelle, in, in your organization that, that might be helping your organizations that are navigate all this change around clarity of roles? Yeah, and I, I think some of the things that, um, that we've been trying to get to is actually being able to build kind of what are, what's the structure, right? I think a lot of times what ends up happening is there's all of these, and especially where I am in the small to mid market space, there's all these jobs that were created potentially for people, right? Because the work is just the work, right? Somebody has got to do it and I don't care what title we give you, but now I have a job description that doesn't really match up with the way the organization needs to kind of go forward and build on that. So we've been kind of pushing on the fact that we need to get the structure right first mm -hmm. and then, and then build kind of what those jobs are that support that. So we've been doing a lot with, um, kind of building out what does our big picture structure look like? What does our org structure look like? Building the second tier, then the third tier, and then building jobs that support that, and then putting the people element into it, right? Instead of starting with, you know, that's always been Susie's job or Billy's job. It's, you know, this is the right role that supports this function, right? Because there are really only three or four key functions across an organization. Maybe there's five or six, but that you start with three or four. You build the right jobs that support that. Then you start to put the right people right behind that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really critical mindset shift. For yeah a small but growing organization to make as they continue to mature. Um, otherwise, it, it becomes impossible to scale the organization. Right. Huge, huge change uh, that's required. So one of the other things um, that um, we talked about with technology early, early on um, to enable is um, kind of continuous listening. I know, Lucia, you've had some experience um, in your prior organizations as well as your current organization of really keeping a pulse of what's going on in the workforce um, and being able to identify key trends and understand what your um, workforce is thinking and, and feeling and, and, and then acting on it to help further engage and support them. Can you elaborate on some, what some of your experiences have, experiences have been? Yeah, I'm so happy you brought this up. I'm really passionate about this topic. Um, so I'm, I'm oriented around this idea of listening at scale. And so when you listen at scale, you can often use technology in order to do that, right? So surveys are one way you can listen at scale and that you can hear from so many people at once. Here at Verda, we do a monthly poll survey, which has typically five questions on it. And then we do twice a year um, a survey that has, I guess, around 20 or 25 questions on it. And so the questions that you experience on a monthly basis are a rotation of those that you get in the twice a year view. And so we, we have a continual pulse on what's happening with the team and we get feedback from them through that, that means. We also do pulses and have conversations through Slack with people about things that we're changing around the office, topics that we think are important. And then I do one-on-ones with every Verton on a rotating basis. So I typically meet with one Verton from a different team every single day. And 
at an earlier point in our history, I was doing it kind of three hours a day, but now I do it about an hour a day. So I have a sense of what people are talking about face to face, what people are thinking about at scale. And I'm merging those two things together to circle back with leaders about, hey, this is the top issue that's happening in your organization right now. I've heard it firsthand. I also can see it in our survey data. You can also see it yourself in these live conversations we're having over Slack. So it really connects the dots for people. And what I've heard from our employee base is that they really appreciate the opportunity to be heard. And I feel that particularly within the Valley and particularly as work evolves, there is a desire for agency and there's a desire for really being seen as a person. And that requires a lot of listening from organizations. And so uh, in a way, the act of listening has its own value, independent of the changes, which we do need to implement in relation to that listening. But independent of those, of those changes, I think the listening itself is really valuable to people. I would agree. John? Yeah, so I, I, would, uh, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And I, I sort of love the idea of listening at scale. So if we just pause for 10 seconds and think about what life was like a decade ago, corporate America, when you had to get a message out to people, right? And you had to do a town hall and you had to go on these global tours and you had to make sure that your message was similar. So just think about the fact that you can get a message out to millions and millions of people just like that, right? And to Lucia's point, you can listen to what the chatter is. So as a leader and from a leadership perspective, think of the power that you can leverage from that, just being able to listen to all of those voices. Uh, I've also had some experience with uh, these uh, pulse survey instruments, uh, and I found, have found them to be quite useful. And I love the way that Lucia sort of is using those uh, within her organization. Uh, there are any number of, the, of vendors who, who provide that service, but having that real-time information available at a leader's fingertips so that they can make adjustments and pivot as needed is really, really critical. And the final thing that I would say about that is it's most effective in organizations where they put a high value really on psychological safety, right? So every time I see pulse survey results come across my screen, you know, it's not a personal attack on me, right? It's a way to improve the organization and sort of having that foundation of psychological safety, although it sounds kind of touchy-feely for a lot of people, it's critically important for these types of instruments in order to be able to gather the business intelligence and pull out of them what you need to move the organization forward. So I love what, you're, what we're saying about that. Mm -hmm. I would agree. It's absolutely imperative to have that psychological safety in the environment. Otherwise, you end up with the, the challenge that uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out with all of your data, right? So, um, to create the right sort of environment where you can take all of this insight um, and, and ensure that it's meaningful and then drive action from it, you've, you've got to create, have the right environment. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add, Heidi, that um, as we talk about listening as a, as a capability of, let's say, the people organization or leadership in an organization, recognize that we've been listening to customers and across all organizations for many years. And the notion that listening as a concept is something we need to do better about in the future through the lens of HR is good to know that uh, that's something that should be at the forefront. What I'd love to see happen is that the practices, for example, Lucia, that you're describing, that the listening quality and approaches and the analytics that come from those processes actually on the flip side become opportunities for the way your company engages with its customers because it set a pattern of success that should be translated externally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So one, one quick thing I would add to that, that I think could be sort of instructive. So if you look back uh, over the past three or four decades at the business round table, for example, so They've made sort of a pivot lately to exactly what you guys are talking about, and that is more of a focus on stakeholders, which includes employees and customers. So prior to all of this, you know, the business roundtable's primary objective was to serve the shareholders, serve the shareholders, serve the shareholders. That was the message that was written into their corporate documentation. So they made a pivot with that recently, uh, within the last couple of months or so. So now they're focused on stakeholders, which is a huge opportunity really for us 
because um, now those organizations are going to be focused not just on their shareholders and returning value to them, but how does that translate with employees? How does that translate with vendors and customers, et cetera? So that is also kind of a pivotal shift, uh, I think, in how we think about employees and customers. It's a really valuable point, John. And I think for any HR practitioners that are um, on this call today, um, really thinking about how they can leverage that change um, to make sharing, enable sharing the voice of the workforce or the prior, reprioritizing or the voice of the workforce um, will be incredibly, incredibly important. So one of the questions that um, also came up in the, the um, discussion from our audience um, has to do not only with um, what are the data that kind of we're seeing through this listening, but are there any things that are emerging as questions from either your boards or from leadership teams um, that they want to hear, understand more about? Mm. Well, at least for me, I can speak from my own organization, my own experience. Typically, leaders want to understand what's going to influence engagement because they understand that engagement can predict attrition. So it's a pretty clear business link there. And there are you know, different things that influence engagement across different organizations. And then there are also often top level organizational wide phenomena like your benefits, your compensation, your equity that can also influence engagement. But I would say typically to a lower extent, unless you have a real problem uh, in your organization, it's, it's typically different department by department. And there are phenomena that leaders have a really big impact on that influence engagement and, and that they can see shift when they make changes. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Hi, I would, yeah, yeah, what I would add there is if there was a measure of anything that listening can provide is the extent to which trust exists in the organization mm -hmm. and how that is being uh, used or misused or is being uh, undervalued or not being taken care of enough. And in organizations, let's say where I am, which are mission driven, uh, there is a great emphasis on are we living up to the mission? Are we living our values? Are we serving our community? And to what degree does uh, the data show that internally, compared to what we do on a reputational survey basis as well, match up so that who we say we are is exactly the way we are being uh, received by the other side. And so that's a key element that is talked about in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michelle? We're seeing that as well on our size companies. We're seeing a lot of focus on what is the culture, right? As we're coming through a transaction where, you know, they were this independent entity and now they're owned by a private equity firm, what changes culturally? And I think it all leads back to the fact of, you know, how do we engage our employees? What is, what is it you've built and how do we sustain that? And the board is constantly, at least what we are experiencing, checking in on that. Is our culture right? Are we listening to the right things? Are, are we engaging on the right experiences? Are we ensuring that our employees are seeing an enablement of some sort, an enhancement, if you will, versus just the standard tactical HR functionality? So I think there's a big need by the board to push and, and make sure that your culture is right. And I'm, I'm hearing that on a regular basis is, is our culture aligned? Are we moving in the right direction? Are, you know, no one wants to kind of get off of that. <laughs> Terrific. So related to that, and actually, um, I don't know if any, any of you had a chance to listen to what Dave Elric was saying on this, um, one of the earlier sessions this morning, but he spent a good amount of time talking about the value of intangibles and everything that leadership and culture um, really do create in terms of value for an organization um, that enable the rest of, you know, the innovation and the business success to, to happen. So um, in light of some of what you shared, Michelle, and some of the other conversations we've already had, um, you know, all of this technology is helpful. Um, are there things you're seeing your leaders do differently or you're coaching your leaders to do differently to, um, to build transparency and cultivate engagement? Um, you know, everything we've, we've just talked about kind of keeps coming back to this foundation of trust. Are there actions that you're seeing um, that pay off that are really creating value in your organizations where leaders are either um, behaving 
in a way that they always have and, and doing things really well or doing things differently as a result of having access to more insight and data? Well, I think I, I, I can just speak for what we're doing and, and we are lacking a lot on the data side, right? I mean, we've done th the dil due diligence. We went through the analysis of that, but that's very different than the, the people elements of that, right? So I, I have lots of data about an organization, but what I don't have is a true sense of the culture. So what we've started to do, which I think has been huge in our due diligence process, is get an understanding of that. Assessing where their culture is today as we're coming in, you know, as an entity to help invest in that organization so that we ensure that that's sustainable. Do, you know, what is the culture today? And let's not try to change that. There may be a few things we want to tweak along the way, but let's put the pieces in place that we build and enable that culture to be what it is, to be better than it could have been without, you know, with, with the investment that we're making in it. So I think we are, we continue to see kind of that emphasis on, you know, what do we have today and how do we keep it in place from a, from a cultural perspective and where it doesn't work, let's make those changes. Mm -hmm. So some of the things you guys have talked about in terms of surveying and those pieces come right behind it, right? We've done focus groups. So we're doing, you know, you're looking up front the organization, knowing what you're going into and then ensuring that your leadership is capable and enabled. So looking at that is kind of step one for us, ensuring that we have the right, the right people in the right seats that, you know, that our leadership will allow us to continue to sustain that culture and then building behind that, again, that structure, then putting in those pieces that continue to, to allow us to check in on the employees. You know, coming from a uh, startup environment before I came to where I am now, one of the common threads uh, to your question, Heidi, is the engagement of leaders with candidates in the marketplace and how we present ourselves through the recruiting process. And going from either of those cultures, the one thing that is common is that the way we present ourselves throughout the process matters. And where we are now, which is much more of a mobile first approach in the way that we're selecting and engaging with future candidates uh, and bringing people up to speed around that process has paid enormous benefits in they being motivated by who they're a part of and by candidates being excited by the fact that an organization that they might perceive one way is in fact operating the other way. And the data shows by virtue of the level of interaction we have on the platform that we use, which is Convey IQ, um, it has provided a, a stronger understanding about who we are as a place to work and why I might want to come work here. And for managers, it's data they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. yeah. The things that I that I typically advise my leaders on in relation to having access to this new information are transparency and action. I think that transparency is, we have the, the capability for transparency that we never had before and that we actually know the answer to a lot of these questions now. Um, like we know how employees are feeling because they're literally telling us and they're telling us at scale. And so I think it's, it's something that's extremely powerful for leaders to be able to say, I see you, I hear you, I know you're unhappy with this and this and this. And this is the action that I'm going to take in relation to what you've said to me. And so one of the things that I encourage my leaders to do is to share their results, share your 360 results, share the, the feedback that you're receiving within your organization with your team and own those results. And I find that that is a very important connective moment for those leaders because the teammates know that they're being heard and they can then hold their leaders accountable to making the changes that they've agreed to that are in relation, you know, in direct relation to what they've said. So it really reinforces the system and leads people to use it effectively over time. But it also builds a sense of connection with that leader because you know that that person understands what your needs are and is going to do something about them. Great. Thanks, Lucia. So with that, um, are there any risks that you all see? Um, associated with, with creating this sort of environment and being able to support your organization in navigating using technology and, um, you know, creating simplicity where possible out of all this complexity. Are there any risks that come to mind for each of you in terms of um, things that if we just move too quickly, we might not realize that, you know, ends up having an implication on our organization um, that's not, not, not moving us toward the outcomes we're looking to achieve? 
are there um, as you know as so as folks move forward and kind of navigate all of this change and complexity, any suggestions around um, what to watch out for and and what to make sure we do um, to continue to support our organizations and capitalizing on all of this change and being successful? Definitely burnout is a thing that my team and I talk about all the time, um, both within my function. So us being burned out on, hey, we're hearing all this stuff from, from teammates. We want to do all the things that they want, but we just, we don't have a, enough people to execute on all of this. How are we going to make the team's needs and our ability to execute fit and the burnout there, but also burnout from the team in that, hey, we're cycling you through so many changes, which you said you wanted, uh, but once you're in the process of experiencing those changes and your world flips upside down, you, you start to feel differently. And so I think it's important for us as leaders to have some sort of view into the way that the organization is going to feel going through those changes mm -hmm. and kind of predict predict that and and bring that learning into our decisions independent of what is being requested. Like we, we can't be um, oriented around just delivering whatever people want. We have to have our own sense of strategy that, that takes that information into account, but that doesn't just execute, execute, execute on, you know, whatever the organization is asking for. I think that is such a critical piece of what we do. Can, you know, consumption. Employees cannot consume all the things that we could potentially talk at them, right? And then it's, and then why? Why are you going through all that? So you have to help them with, you know, the speed of change, the need to change, and, and the reality of the ability to consume, right? So I always say, you know, and I think I started with this, but you have to know where you're going. So I think to your point, Lucia, kind of put, take a step back, pulling up, out of the day-to-day -day stuff, all the stuff you're trying to do to help your employee base and have a real reason on why you're headed there. And then, then there's a roadmap to get there. It's not kind of, you know, that ready, aim, fire versus, you know, aim, fire, ready. You know, you have to know where you're going and you have to ensure that your leadership is there with you and they're, they're buying into it, they're supporting it and they're working with you. And then you have to put it in digestible bites. I mean, just trying to throw things out because you're hearing that from you, you know, you're listening doesn't mean that, you, you know, they have the ability to consume. So my, mm -hmm. my advice would be be careful with, too many initiatives, too many things happening, and without having a real roadmap on how to get there. I know that, uh, I know Steve probably wants to chime in on this one as well, so I'll, I'll, I'll be a little quick. So I, I, I totally agree with all of that. And so this sort of circles back to one of the things we talked about a little bit earlier, which is part of the HR role is sense making, is helping to make sense of all of this for employees and uh, kind of starting with the objective, right? So the, the what, if it's start with your organizational objectives or your personal or departmental objectives and what data do we need to inform our actions relative to those objectives? Not the other way around, not sort of having a blank sheet of paper and taking all the data and trying to make sense out of it to create objectives. Although that balance is going to be necessary because you always want to be open to what the data might tell you and how you can translate that into business intelligence that you can use to move forward. So it's really about making sense of all of that for employees and making the right decisions and separating the data that you can turn into business intelligence from all of the noise around that and being very clear and concise and crisp with that message and the delivery of that uh, to the workforce. I think there is uh, there is a, I think there is a, uh, people are more likely to want to move faster than slower. And when, you know, Lucia, when you talk about burnout, particularly in startup business environments or all fast moving environments, I, I think uh, in spite of what you might think, um, slowing down is what matters and giving people the space to slow down and make decisions appropriately using all the tools that might be at their availability is something that organizations need to understand and adapt towards. Even though there's a need to speed decision making, how the work gets done each day, how teams interact, whether or not I have as much me time versus we time is something that organizations need to think a lot about because while there is a why towards what we're doing, there has to be an appropriate pace 
or approach that gets people moving forward in a positive way and it doesn't feel like you're dragging people with them. And I think we are hitting a point, and, and John, this goes your reference to thank you for being late, that as long as the rate of change is faster than humans' ability to keep up with it, we're probably putting people in a position where moving fast is the only solution. And I would suggest that might be a recipe for disaster. And we're going to need for people to stop and think as much as act and do. Really valuable point. And actually maybe one of the key takeaways that some of our audience members take is, you know, how do they as HR practitioners really support their organization and um, being able to um, move, move slow in order to move fast. So um, our time has flown by. So thank you, Steve, Michelle, Lucia, John. But that's a thought-provoking discussion. I feel like we could go on for another hour. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Uh, I hope you'll stay tuned for our final session of the, the day, a sense of belonging in the need for HR communities. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.